Hey everyone. So today I want to talk a bit about the annotated bibliography. Some of you may have written one before, uh, some of you may not have. You've read about it in uh, one of the chapters in the Norton book when we were working on the critique. And it's actually going to be shorter and I think easier than the critique paper. Um, there is a reason why we're doing an annotated bibliography even after having written a critique of sources. So I want to go over the reasons for that today, talk about how it will help you as you develop your analysis paper, and how it will also help me to judge uh, if you're taking on a project that will work well for you. So if you look back over chapter 15 in the Norton, that is going to give you an explanation and some examples of annotated bibliographies. Basically, it is an entry uh, for a source that you're reading in which you describe what the source um, is about. You give its publication information, that is um, basically the MLA works cited page info and then you evaluate the source in some way. Sometimes, like in our critique paper, that means setting up specific criteria and discussing how this source does. For this assignment, the focus will be, how will this source help me write my paper? So there will be three basic ingredients to your annotated bibliography. For each entry, you will say, here's what this source is about, here's the citation, and here's how I think it'll help me write my paper. So this is what we call an evaluative annotated bib. You might have written a, just a descriptive one before on um, which you just summarized the source in detail. Ours, I mean to be useful in actually helping you think about your research and develop your paper. That's the goal of this, um, and I do hope that it'll be useful to you. So your annotated bibliography is going to look like this. You only need to write entries for three sources. You can certainly use more sources in your paper, and you may even find it useful to write annotated bibliography entries for more than three sources. That is entirely up to you, but you only need to write three entries for this project. You will include an introduction paragraph that just tells me you know, what is your analysis paper going to be about, why have you conducted this research, where are you hoping it'll take you, and then you'll have three paragraphs. Each one will start with a citation of the source. You'll offer a brief three to four sentences summary of what the source is about, and then a short description, two to three sentences, of how you think you'll use this source in your paper. What will it help you um, to do in your paper? And this can all be kind of tentative because you're going to be at different places in the research process. This assignment is also to get you researching uh, potentially, but it's okay if you're not entirely certain if you'll end up using these sources. This assignment's meant to help you you know, figure that part out, essentially. So the introduction of your annotated bib is just a short paragraph. Tell me the topic of your analysis, what you're hoping to discuss in your paper. You might not have a solid thesis statement yet of what you want to argue with your analysis. That's okay. Uh, tell me where you're at right now when it comes to the topic of your paper. Talk a little bit about why you found these sources, basically, like what were you hoping to find in your research? What was the reason for choosing these sources right now? And then also think towards the future. Are there other kinds of sources you hope to find? Are there more things you need to think about? Uh, this is a place for you to reflect on that, which will help me to maybe give you some advice and also help you to have a record of your research and thinking process as you work on the analysis. So here's an example introduction. It is tentative. Um, I've written it so that it looks like something you might write where maybe you don't yet know a specific argument. So you're kind of just thinking on the page. I think that's useful. So here's what we've got. 
In my analysis, I will examine the changes over time and how vampires are feared and or desired. I am conducting historical and psychological research in order to help me understand the reasons behind trends in vampire depictions from Bram Stoker's Dracula to the present. I anticipate that I will need to settle on a few specific examples from particular points in history and that I'll need to be careful not to just focus on summarizing different stories. Therefore, at least half of my essay should focus on my interpretation of the modern example or examples I choose. I'm currently considering contrasting Shadow Hunters and V Wars. Both explore vampirism as an infection, but Shadow Hunters features vampires as potentially desirable and V-Wars treats vampires primarily as threats. The goal of my analysis is to make an argument about why we crave both right now. So I want you to notice a couple of specific things happening in this introduction. I start with a general topic that I'm hoping to explore. I talk about the research I'm conducting, how I hope it will help me. I talk about some things that I know I need to still work on and that I should keep in mind that, okay, I can't just summarize a bunch of vampire stories, that I actually need to develop an argument. And so you can see towards the bottom of my intro is where I'm really trying to think about what do I want to do with my paper that's unique? What is my argument going to be? And in that last sentence, you see the beginning of a thesis statement. The goal of my analysis is to make an argument about why we crave both fearful vampires or rather scary vampires and sexy vampires or whatever. Um, now, I haven't yet answered the why. When I figure that out, that will be my thesis statement. That will be the goal of my analysis paper to show my readers that I came to that conclusion through careful analysis and hopefully some of this research will help me, though I might need to, you know, consult some other sources as I go as well. So here we have a list of three possible sources that I could use in my annotated bibliography. And I've just put some information here um, of what the sources contain. I'll show you an actual annotated bibliography entry in just a minute. But I have two academic sources here and one that I've deemed credible, but it's not academic. I've noted on the analysis um, assignment directions that one of your sources in your final paper does need to be an academic source. But for your um, annotated bibliography, it's okay if you haven't found that source yet. Um, you don't have to have that in the annotated bib. So we've got Dracula, Vampires, Perversity, and Victorian Anxieties, and this source gives me some historical context and some clues for how I might end up analyzing vampires. Uh, so Buzzwell talks about how they symbolized fear and desire in the Victorian era, and that might give me um, a basis of principles I could use in my analysis to look at how fear and desire is represented differently um, in different time periods. Then I've got another academic source, which, you know, full of citations that I might even track some of those down and see if they're useful to me as a source. Uh, but it's Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's Fear of the Monster is really a kind of desire. And you can tell right away from that title that that might be helpful to me. And it offers uh, a psychoanalytic basis for why fear and desire can be connected, and that would be a really useful analytical tool in my paper. And then we've got a source that is from a news uh, publication, and it does include citations, it does include quotes from professionals, and so I've deemed it trustworthy, but it's not actually an academic source, it's not written uh, by an academic, peer-reviewed by academics. So it's okay for my paper, but if that was, if I was trying to say that was my one academic source, it wouldn't really work so well. But this article is a nice overview of the various reasons why people say we're drawn to monster narratives, 
and there was a particularly interesting tidbit. It was only covered briefly, which is why you need more lengthy academic articles, but it had a quotation from a scientist who mentioned that in our brains, um, there's a connection between fear and empathy that is highlighted when we watch monster narratives. And so that might tell me, okay, as I continue my research, can I find an academic source that gives me more detail, not even about monsters, but how fear and empathy work in our brains. And that might help me figure out why the vampire can be both attractive and, uh, disgusting or whatever it is that we feel when we're afraid. So all of these things, you can see the pattern that's developing in my research. I may not yet know my exact argument, but I've got a definite theme going. And hopefully, you know, this annotated bibliography might help me just in writing things down, develop my thoughts more. So this is an example of an annotated bibliography entry. So your annotated bib paper has your intro, and then it's going to have one of these for each of your three sources. So right at the top, this would be its own paragraph. I would cite my source in MLA style. This is the Greg Buswell article. And then I have a paragraph that contains uh, those two ingredients that I mentioned earlier in the video. Summarize your source, what's it about, and then specifically tell me how this source will be useful for your paper. Now you did something like this in your critique. In each body paragraph, you talked about a source and you critiqued its usefulness for X purpose or Y criteria. And then at the end, you wrote a synthesis paragraph that talked about how your three sources together might be useful for a larger project. But that was a hypothetical paper, unless you've decided to continue with your critique topic. So at this point, we're now getting more real, I suppose, and you're saying this is one of my sources for a paper I actually am writing. So let me look at how I plan for it to be useful. Now this means if you are continuing with your critique paper topic, you can use parts of your critique. I don't mind if you copy paste aspects of it into your annotated bib, as long as you update it to reflect more so that this is no longer theoretical, but here are your actual plans for using this source. So let's take a look at the actual annotation. You can see that about half of it is summary and then half of it is my plan. So I won't bother reading the summary. You can see it there if you're interested. Uh, but here's where I talk about how it will be useful for me. This source is useful for my paper because it provides me with a starting point for how vampires have always been a mixture of fear and desire and serve as metaphors for the times and places in which vampire narratives are published. I'll use this to establish historical context in my essay and use it as a touchstone to help me analyze how modern vampire TV series explore contemporary fears and desires. That's all you need to do. A few sentences that summarize the source's content, and then a few sentences that talk about how you hope to use the source in your paper. Now, once you start writing your analysis, maybe it'll turn out that you don't need this source anymore, you find a better one, or your focus changes, that's okay. You are not married to your annotated bib. You don't have to use the three sources you put in it. I hope you do. I hope this is useful to you in your process, but it's okay if you end up changing as you go. That's totally fine. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about research resources. So if you're putting together your annotated bibliography, you obviously need sources for it. Uh, so I did want to go over a few things for um, how you might find some good sources for your analysis paper that you can discuss in your annotated bibliography. Now there's a lot of great information on the Santa Fe Library's website. I would normally talk more about the things that they cover in class and we would probably do a library visit together or even schedule a librarian to come and talk to our class. 
but I know that the longer that my videos get, the less likely you're probably going to watch them. So I'm not going to cover all of this here. I'm going to take advantage of some of the videos and guides that the library already has, like I've listed here, and encourage you to check those out on your own and ask me, the librarians, questions as they come up. I am going to go over a few things for now, but in the description of this video, you'll find links uh, to Research 101, research tools, subject guides, and video tutorials from uh, the Tyree Library at Santa Fe. I'm also going to send those links to you, and I'll post them on Canvas, uh, because I think that's going to cover um, a lot of stuff, and you can find the info you need, rather than sitting through a 25 minute video for me where not all of it might apply to your research. But I do want to go over a couple of things here that I think are important, not just for the annotated bibliography, but for all of the research for your analysis paper. So what constitutes an academic source? I've said that you do need to have one of your sources in the analysis must be academic. Now, all of your sources should be credible. They shouldn't be by somebody with the username soccerfan52. Um, it should be a website that you know seems professional, that you trust, but your academic source has to fit certain criteria. So almost always, you're not gonna go wrong if you find an article from a peer-reviewed scholarly journal that has in-depth citations and you're going to find those through the databases that we've talked about on the library website and also maybe through something like Google Scholar. Books are also academic, ones often published by academic presses. Uh, a lot of times it will say, you know, University of Florida Press or Oxford University Press. Those aren't the only publishers that qualify as academic, but, um, you know, those are a couple, and I will take a look at some other examples as well. But if you ever have any doubts about whether or not a source is academic, you can, of course, email me and I'll check it out for you. Generally, you could look up, okay, who is this author that's associated with this book? Are they a professional in their field? Does their book contain citations, footnotes, all of the cornerstones of academic research? If those things aren't there, then it likely doesn't constitute an academic source. It doesn't mean you can't use it. It might be really good, but it wouldn't count as a scholarly source. Now, there are other sources that sometimes might be considered academic. It really depends upon the quality. So sometimes .edu websites and other websites out there that are associated with uh, trusted intellectual institutions, uh, certain encyclopedias online written by experts, reviewed by expert editors, not things like Wikipedia that are able to be edited by anyone, even if I do think Wikipedia has its own uses, it's definitely not something we would consider academic. So this is something important to keep in mind to check for as you're considering your sources. And I want to go over briefly, uh, we've talked about databases before with your last paper, but a reminder that if you're looking for scholarly articles, Google, Google Scholar is a good bet. Uh, make sure that you log into your Santa Fe Library account online first. That way the sources that come up on Google Scholar, uh, basically you'll be communicating to Google that yes, I have access as a Santa Fe student and Santa Fe Library has paid for me to access articles that would otherwise cost me money, which you should never do. <laughs> Don't pay for access to something. So. You log into Santa Fe Library uh, with your student ID number and the last four digits of your ID number as your password. Uh, so this will probably come up if you are using the library databases. It'll prompt you to log in. Now there's a whole section on different research databases on the Santa Fe Library website. All of them are valid and worth checking out but a few that I recommend for most people's projects, they can be pretty, you know, they cover a lot of different kinds of articles. Academic Search Complete, Sage Journals, JSTOR, and Humanity Source. 
So each of those databases has access to thousands of academic journals that could yield you some useful sources. If one of them isn't bringing up good stuff for you, try another one. An important part of research is never just using one method of search and not giving up at the first sign of difficulty because it often just means you need different tools and we have a lot of them available. And of course, you can always ask me for help too if you're hitting a roadblock with your research. Now, if you want to search for potentially academic web pages, maybe you're not finding the stuff you need on the databases or you just want to see what else is out there, you can make use of Google, not even Google Scholar, but the advanced Google search. So instead of just searching regular, like type in a word on Google, you would go to google.com slash advanced search. And then when you're able to customize your search, you can go to narrow your results by and then type in .edu or .org or whatever it is that you want to limit your search to. Now, this is not proof, uh, foolproof, as I'm going to show you. Not every .edu site is actually going to qualify as a scholarly source, uh, but you probably will yield some stuff that could work there too. So let's take a look at that. All right, so let's take a look here. So you can see the advanced uh, search web page. We've got a lot of different ways you can customize your search. So I'm going to put in just a general search term of vampires, which is probably going to be way too broad, but I want to show it as an example. And you can see that you can get more specific in these other boxes. And I am going to narrow your results by site or domain and I'm going to type in .edu. I could also add uh, things like .org or .gov, uh, but this is what I want to go with for now. So then I just hit advanced search and I scroll and see what comes up. Now, not all .edu sites will qualify as academic sources or even useful sources. So something like this, you see this is from Berkeley, good school, cool. But you can also see it looks like it's just like a, a news post, maybe a blog post. Uh, a spooky Halloween post doesn't immediately make me think, ah oh, yes, scholarly article. So if I pull that up, it could very well be interesting. And sometimes it might even, aha, cite a source that might be academic. A paper published in 2017. Uh, so maybe I could check that out, but I wouldn't consider this, despite its level of detail, uh, an academic source. But you could check out some of the links and see where they take you. I admit I am very curious about Karl Marx, a vampire hunter, uh, but, you know, that's a story for another day. So now it's a possibility, but let me go back and see what else I can find. See here we've got something from Princeton. Cool. Let's check it out. It may or may not be the kind of thing we're looking for. All right, Dracula joins Star Trek. All right, so this looks like a very old web page design, so likely not something that's been updated for a while. And it does have some references, but yeah, this is not screaming an academic source to me. The credentials of the author are listed simply as computer engineer and vampire aficionado. So yeah, we're going to mix this one too. So you can see that this search method can give you a lot of information, but not all of it will necessarily be useful. So I'm going to scroll through here and just kind of check out the titles and see if anything sticks out to me as being useful. So that's a blog entry, but we could have some useful links. I'm going to say, let's see, I'm going to go to another page, see what I come up with. All right, so here's a course, which maybe could list some readings that might be useful to me. Um, here's a library guide from uh, another university that might point me towards some sources. So that alone could be useful that a .edu search might point you towards bibliographies of sources. So I might need to, what might help me is to get more specific with my search terminology rather than just putting vampires, right? That might not be enough. And so what I am going to do is go back to the advanced search 
and mix that up a little bit. So let's see those other two I pulled up. Well, we're beginning with a GIF, so wow, cool. Probably not, again, an academic source. Maybe interesting, might help me think of stuff, but not something I would cite as my scholarly source. Here, I've got a library website that might point me towards some possible sources. Books and ebooks. Oh, so that could be useful. I could look up these books at our library website and see if we have any of them. And I am going to talk to you about Santa Fe Library ebooks, uh, which we can all access in our social distancing times. So you can see that some of these .edu websites can point us to other resources. So here are some scholarly articles that this library website has listed that you, know, you might check out. All right, so we're going to go back to the advanced search. And this time I am going to also include vampires and psychology uh, because that was something that was a part of my annotated bibliography introduction that I was thinking of fear and desire. Obviously, those are principles that have been studied by psychologists for quite some time in a lot of different ways. So let's see if any .edu websites come up uh, that give me some more specific and more useful sources. All right, so we're seeing different sources this time that are going to be more focused on the subtopic of vampires that I'm researching. So let's take a peek and see if any of them are more scholarly than some of the ones I found before. So the European Vampire Applied Psychoanalysis. So that does kind of ping uh, for what the kind of stuff I've been looking for. And so what do we got here? All right, so we've got a PDF. So it's probably a book chapter or article. The European Vampire Applied Psychoanalysis and Applied Legend by Richard Gottlieb from the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. So this might be something useful to me. So I'm going to just do a quick scan through it. Okay, it's from an academic journal called Folklore Forum. And I could look up that journal to find out more info if I want to make sure it's something I trust. But generally, this tips me off that it's an academic journal because it's the 24th volume and the second issue. And that's almost always how you see uh, scholarly journals uh, publishing. They tell you the volume and the issue. So you can see that there are citations in here uh, that we're going to find a number of sources at the end which will tell me if this was well-researched. Actually, we have an annotated bibliography. So this is actually pretty useful. You could read about all of the sources that Gottlieb uses and see if any of them are also useful to you. Uh, so this is actually a pretty decent source that I found from Google Advanced Search. So that's also an option you have available to you. Feel free to experiment with it. But I would say as far as finding academic sources go, start with the library databases, start with Google Scholar, but this is also a possibility. Another option online outside of the library resources are academic encyclopedias. So these need to be carefully judged before you use them. Only look at encyclopedias or rather only use encyclopedias that tell you they are written by experts and you actually find the names and credentials of those people, that they are reviewed each entry by editors who have academic credentials, and that it, this is a website that cannot be edited by the public, like Wikipedia. Some of these sources can be useful for giving you a basic understanding of complex principles that you might, you might use as analytical tools. So maybe you want to apply um, a theory by Marx uh, in your paper, but you don't exactly have time to read Das Kapital by Karl Marx right now. So trusting an academic who specializes in research on that person to break down their thoughts for you so that you can use them to help you analyze, some academic encyclopedias can be very useful for purposes like that. So you want to make sure that the work cited is present 
on any academic encyclopedia entry, and sometimes even just those citations can give you um, some research methods to approach. Don't overly rely upon academic encyclopedias, but I have listed a couple of examples of appropriately academic ones. There's the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and then actually encyclopedia.com is it bad. Um, all of its entries are sourced from Oxford University Press, Columbia University Press, and Cengage, which are all reliable academic publishers. So let's actually take a quick look at that and you can see what I mean as far as what are the credentials and the criteria that you need to use if you're going to uh, draw upon an encyclopedia as a source. All right, so I'll leave this for you to play around with and see what you find, but let's just do a quick example search, what I can find out about psychoanalysis since that's been coming up in some of my research. So let's see what we get. All right, so ignore the ads and make sure you're looking at the actual entries. You can see the last time in which they were updated. So that doesn't, I don't know what that's about. So philosophy and psychoanalysis. So let's check that out. And now it's important for you to judge carefully whether or not this source is useful and trustworthy. This one comes from Cengage, and we can take a look at the kind of information that's provided. It gives me a breakdown of some um, well-known psychoanalytic theorists like Freud, like Lacan, whose work is admittedly rather difficult to get through on your own. So it might be useful to find an article that discusses some of their theories, or might even use something like this, which tells me uh, more about these kinds of theories that maybe I can use in my paper to help me analyze something from a psychological perspective. So lots of different philosophers and psychoanalysts mentioned. And then here we have a bibliography. So maybe some of these sources would be useful to me. I could check them out. Probably not the ones in French, unless you speak French, read French. But further reading, so I might check some of those out. And then it also recommends some other possible sources. So really, I would say this is not your first choice, uh, but if you're having some trouble understanding some of the concepts that are coming up in scholarly articles, then some encyclopedias might be worth checking out, but only if they are appropriately academic. So when I go back uh, to like the front page of an acad academic encyclopedia, you know, how do I judge uh, its usefulness, its reliability, its trustworthiness. So I'm going to look at its about page. It's going to tell me where they source their content. And there are other encyclopedias from academic sources that are very good, but generally they cost money. So this is one of the main ones that is free that I would say is relatively trustworthy. But always use critical thinking to judge your sources. All right, and there's one last thing I want us to take a quick look at, which is finding ebooks through the library website. So you still do have access to books. Do I expect you to read a whole book right now? No, uh, but there are many academic books that have individual essays in them, one of which could end up being quite useful for your paper. So if you go to the library website, you would scroll down you can see here's all those databases for finding scholarly articles. Here are guides for different research topics. Here is information to get help from librarians, uh, even online as we're learning remotely. There are still librarians out there to help you. But we've got the traditional library catalog, which is going to direct us towards sources, books, videos, but let's focus specifically on ebooks electronic books that we have access through our library credentials. So you can use any kind of search term you want. If you know an author or title, maybe in another source you found a reference to an article that sounds, or rather a book that sounds good, you can see if we have it. But you can also just use a general keyword search. So I am going to go with something very basic. And again, specialized searches are often useful, but sometimes this can lead me to some good stuff. So I'm just going to put vampire. 
So that's what my paper, my imaginary paper is on. And so what do we have here? So obviously I can go over here and specialize uh, my search, limit my search terms a bit. So that's always worth taking a look at. Um, so we've got Adventure Time and Philosophy. All right, the Ashgate Encyclopedia of Literary and Cinematic Monsters. Ashgate, uh, I know this as a very uh, well-received academic publisher. So if they are putting out a specialized encyclopedia, it's generally going to be um, an academic one. And I also know the name Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock. I've read other work by him. He is a scholar of horror, and so he is somebody I would trust. Now, not all of you will have that immediate knowledge, so when you check out the source, right, you would see, okay, who is this guy? What are his credentials? Who is Ashkey? What are their credentials as a publisher? And of course, you can always check with me too. And it doesn't, again, not all of your sources need to be strictly academic, but if you are looking for one, you might find an ebook that is helpful to you. So I can click here to view the ebook. And I am already logged in, so it's not gonna ask me to do that right now, but I can see a summary of the book and I am able to access various entries from the book. So it is an encyclopedia, so I'm going to scroll all the way down to V, um, see V for Vampire, and see what this source has to offer me. So there's actually quite a bit here. Like I said, uh, the author of Weinstock is a noted academic in this field, and so you can see that he breaks down a lot of information. Um, historical vampires, romanticism in vampires, uh, so we've got a lot of stuff here. Cinematic, 19th century, and then also a handy list of suggested reading of sources that might be useful to you. So that's a possibility. I'm going to go back and see if there is anything else worth checking out. Not even just necessarily an academic source, but another source that I can deem credible enough uh, that I could use. So we've got... Dracula and Philosophy from a publisher called Open Court, which I haven't heard of before, but presumably our library is not going to give us access to crops, so it's probably decent. It may or may not qualify as academic, however, but not all of your sources need to be academic, just one of them. So we have some chapter lists here. To actually access it, I simply click Santa Fe, click here, and I'm going to have ebook access. Well, maybe I will. My activity has... All right, here we go. So your institution has unlimited access to this book, which is good for me. So I can download it. I can read it online. I can look at individual chapters because, again, you're not going to read a whole book right now, but you might find a particular chapter to be useful. Now, a lot of these are pretty big. 50-page articles? Maybe not but you've got a lot of options, so do make sure to take a look at ebooks. There are plenty that could be useful to you. We've got um, access to these things through the Santa Fe Library, so you don't have to pay for any books or anything, and you don't have to rely upon physical books in the library that you can't get your hands on right now. So we do have other things here. So that's worth checking out, but it's up to you. You've got lots of different resources available. Your annotated bib only needs to be um, three sources. Your paper doesn't need to have a million sources, but do look for things that will help you conduct the kind of analysis that you are interested in. And finally, library assistance. In the time of COVID-19, the library actually has a special web page devoted to how you can get help from librarians online. They are still working, they are still here for you. So if you go to this webpage on our Santa Fe Library website, you can see that librarians are available to you Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30. So you can chat with a librarian, ask them questions, you can go into an online meeting room, you can email, you can call, you can 
text even. You can set up an appointment. There's all kinds of stuff here. And then there's also basically just YouTube videos to help you with some of the questions that you might have that they have already anticipated. So that's definitely worth keeping in mind. Of course, you can always email me. I can always help you too. But the librarians are research experts, so they're there for any questions that you might have. All right, so this video ended up being way longer than I intended it, uh, but I hope it was useful in uh, going over what the annotated bibliography consists of, which is actually pretty straightforward. But what I ended up focusing more on in this video is the research process which is always worth, um, I think, developing new resources, new skills, uh, new tips uh, for how to find the sources you need. So the next video for this week is going to cover the readings. That'll be posted either Wednesday or Thursday. And in that video, I will discuss how those articles are examples of analyses, what we might learn from them in order to write uh, your own analysis essays. So look for that. I will email you with an update when it's posted on YouTube. And thanks guys. Have a nice day. And as always, email me if you've got questions, uh, set up a Skype appointment, whatever you need.